from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, their sober wishes never learn to stray. Along the cool, sequestered vale of life, they kept the noiseless tenor of their way. Yet even these bones from insult to protect, some frail memorial still erected nigh. With uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculpture decked, implores the passing tribute of a sigh. By hands unseen are showers of violets found. The red breast loves to bill and warble there, and little footsteps lightly print the ground. This 18th century poem evokes our image of the ideal rural graveyard. In this fine and private place, we encounter documents in stone for the lives and death of people who lived before us. But have we always buried and remembered our dead in peaceful places? We humans have long commemorated our dead, but the rituals and logistics of disposal of the body have varied hugely across cultures and over time. In this film, we will see how our monuments and burial customs have changed over the last thousand years as our attitudes towards death have changed. Can we today imagine how our ancestors saw death? Was death personal? or public, welcomed or tragic. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam. A body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And what of the absent dead? Like every parish church in Britain, Thornton Stewart has its memorial to those who did not come back from the Great War. Behind this simple list is a village which lost almost all of its young men. Men who, of right, should be just outside under recent gravestones, or even still alive. This was a collective loss experienced by many communities up and down the country. The memorials in and around every parish church reflect its community, but they do so in different ways at different times. Let's go back to the beginning of this churchyard, back about a thousand years before the Great War, back to the Viking Age. Gravestones from this period are the earliest and the best evidence that we've got, not only for the origin of the graveyard, but also for the beginning of the church. These are fragments of crosses, which originally marked the sites of graves. We know that they were carved sometime between the 9th and the 11th century and that they commemorated early Christians or people with Christian relatives because the symbols on them were taken from the scriptures. This is a particularly rare one. On this side, it shows Christ in majesty. And on the other, we can see the crucifixion. Christian images, but carved in the style of Viking art. These crosses suggest not only that there was an early church on this site, long before we know of one from documents, but also that there was a community which had a local elite, people with families which were important enough to commission high quality crosses to honor their dead, and who must have been in touch with a religious center which could advise on these emblems. In Viking Age Yorkshire, this would have been quite exceptional. Let's move forward in time to sometime in about the 14th century. Medieval Thornton Stewart had important patrons. In this wall, we see a reused coffin lid with the heraldic symbols of a powerful family. And here, a pair of shears, the emblem of a woman, suggesting that this coffin lid was that of a prominent lady whose initials seem to have been M. Gee. Only people of wealth or status were buried inside the church. The most desirable places were those near the high altar at the far end. In the Middle Ages, most people were buried in the churchyard. 
Their gravestones, those who had them, have long since been pushed aside and the ground reused, which of course disturbed earlier burials. Because of this disturbance, we can still find fragments of human bones in the churchyard today. Medieval people were buried in shrouds or in wooden or stone coffins. Stone coffins were a sign of status. Two survive here, and they do so in a way which allows us to imagine how they would have originally looked. They were not buried, but stood on the surface of the ground, much as these do. And this was so that passers-by would be reminded of the importance of their occupants. We can just about make out the symbols on their lids through the moss. Here, four circles make up the crosshead, with a central box in the middle. In the past, death was accepted as a natural event. Funerals were times of remembrance and celebration. It was more natural then for the living to mingle with the dead, since death was expected to come earlier than it does today. And death usually came at home, surrounded by family and loved ones. Up yonder hill, behold how sadly slow the beer moves, winding from the vale below. There lie the happy dead from trouble free and the glad parish pays the frugal fee. Now to the church, behold, the mourners come, sedately torpid and devoutly dumb. The village children now their games suspend to see the beer that bears their ancient friend. Death had a fascination. It was a great occasion. Mourners were invited to funeral feasts. Vigils were held around the body on the evening before the funeral, and prayers and services for the dead continued to be held to mark the anniversary. But churchyards were not only just places for the dead. They were sometimes used as taverns, rather like today's beer gardens, or theatres, sporting arenas, storage for agricultural products, and as stock enclosures. In the 16th and 17th centuries, a wider social range of people was commemorated by graveyard monuments. These seldom survive. Again, the ground has been reused. But most churchyards will contain monuments of the 18th, 19th or 20th centuries. Here, an 18th century tomb chest stands out from the hundreds of gravestones. Gravestones may be the only things which document the lives of ordinary people. Family groups. A shared grave of two infants. A double memorial for a husband and wife. And somebody who saved two children from drowning, but was drowned herself. Gravestones should be recorded and protected from damage by vandals. Churchyards must also be made safe from collapsing gravestones and made welcoming to the vast array of wildlife which they can support. And this means that our 20th century obsessions with tidied, manicured grass may have to be kept at bay. Thornton Stewart is lucky enough to have a local naturalist overseeing the management of the churchyard. This is Pamela Henderson. Pamela. Now, the churchyard is just a little bit overgrown at the moment. Can you tell me the reasoning behind this? Yes, uh, we leave it like that because of the wildlife. Uh, we have um, butterflies, birds, pheasants, and uh, it's a great shame to hurt them. And it's one of its very special things about the churchyard is its wildness and the fact that it is left alone. Down here is Bugle, which uh, um, it, there's a lot of it about here, and it's, it, it's a very really pretty mm -hmm. plant indeed. And uh, the campion, it grows particularly well here, and there's a paler one, and a darker one. And the uh, ground, ground ivy, and all the smelly thing. Mm, it smells like ivy, you see? Yes. A great range of wild flowers can exist, depending on the habitat that is the soil type, drainage, length of grass, amount of shade, and so on. Even nettles may be allowed to flourish. And I really don't think that nettles do any harm to anyone. 
the species that you find and their ability to survive will depend on the management of the churchyard, so that here, archaeology and nature conservation become linked in a single exercise. With the coming of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, many of our ancestors moved to live and die in towns. As a result, overcrowding in urban churchyards made them unhygienic, and it was no longer healthy for the living to mingle with the dead at funerals. And many of those in towns were nonconformists who would not agree to be buried in consecrated churchyards for religious reasons. So large cemeteries became established on the outskirts of towns. They were, in style, very like the suburbs themselves. They were landscaped spaces which were precisely laid out in graded plots and planted to make them attractive recreational places. Municipal cemeteries, like the York Public Cemetery, began as commercial concerns. They were joint stock ventures in which each grave was recorded, and there were thousands of them. The land, therefore, was used only once. This York Company was founded in 1830. The sketch of the proposal showed a pleasant layout, and the shares were £10 each. Graves at the York Public Cemetery were divided between Church of England on one side and dissenters and non-believers on the other. At the focal point of this division was the chapel come mausoleum built in the Greek Revival style of architecture. Its symmetry perfectly reflected the division between the two halves of the cemetery. Its architect was James Pritchard, who just happened to be a founding member of the York Public Cemetery Company. Inside the chapel were memorials and burials in brick-lined catacombs. The building is in the process of being repaired and renovated, but the vaults below have not yet been touched. exclusive place. These spaces were reserved for the rich because it was incredibly expensive to be buried here. And because of the expected rewards, grave robbers have been here. They broke open one of the coffins. Here you can see why it was so expensive. When you died, your body was sealed in a double wooden coffin, and that was wrapped in a layer of lead so that the body would be preserved. And the coffin lies where it was vandalized. In the 19th century, death became an industry for the new profession of undertakers, fed by the Victorian desire for display and public mourning. Just where you had your grave was socially important. If you were rich, there was no problem. You had the best places on the higher ground, and people had to climb up to see you. And you, or your family, could spend a lot of money to have an impressive monument. Further down the hill, it's a little different. At the other extreme is the simple slab, lying flat on the ground. And in between, whatever your fancy or purse could dictate. Crosses, of course, of various types. Obelisks. Romantic sculpture, some of it now fallen down, but still looking romantic. Meaningful classical symbolism. An urn, which is what the ancient Greeks would have used to keep their dear departed's ashes in. And behind the bee, a monument which symbolizes a life that was cut off in its prime, a broken column. 
Then there are gravestones which have symbolic carvings on them. Sometimes the meaning is fairly obvious, like a skull to remind you that you're going to die. And cherubs, which you might hope to find if you get to heaven. The fact that you're bound to die anyway, sooner or later, was never left in doubt. These are real skulls, protected now behind a steel grill in the entrance to a churchyard. And they have the words, today for me, tomorrow for thee, inscribed beneath. But sometimes the symbolism isn't so obvious. Here are weeping willow trees, and this looks like the broken arrow of death cutting across the downward torch of life. But this one, with a rake, a flail and a sickle, could symbolize the grim reaper of death, or it may just show the deceased's occupation, maybe a farm laborer, or possibly it does both. However, the majority of graves were marked by simpler upright stones. Graveyards contain a wealth of information just waiting to be recorded before it's too late. And there's a standard way of doing this. Daughter-in-law of the above. The object is to record them as completely as possible. Also, Edward Dawson. That means the full inscription. Died February the 14th. Any part of which may be of interest later. 1946. Aged 80 years. There's a standard form for recording which makes later analysis easier. Condition of monument found. Condition of inscription. Clear, clear. These records can be the basis for many Royal types of type. study. And photography is both quick and important for showing the style of monuments. What sort of questions can be answered as a result of recording the monuments in a graveyard? A few give a great deal of information about the individuals themselves, but generally you need to study a lot of them to be able to find answers to questions such as what are the fashions in Christian names? And are there fashions in tombstone design? What can you tell about the size of families and child mortality? And why do so many men have their occupations given? but women hardly at all. Women are normally shown in relation to their husbands or fathers so that their maiden names or details of their lives are seldom shown. It was extremely rare to find a woman's profession listed, although here there was a family nurse. And then why do some stones last longer than others and some hardly at all? Some are going fast, even the stonemasons. Some just fall apart or get vandalized. And some have already gone. It's too late to record this one. Just a few are really individual, like this gypsy's memorial. People with a bit of money put by for their funerals are likely to be remembered. If you were poor, it was different. Many children's and paupers' graves never had stones at all, and they were exiled to the marginal areas of the cemetery. Many of the war dead ended up here too. With just number, name, rank, and the regimental crest. Not much expression of individuality here. For us today, death is macabre. It is the stuff of horror films, and grave memorials are depressingly standard and mass-produced. It's hard to imagine a time when death was celebrated, when the living were happy to mingle in the places of the dead, when churchyards and cemeteries were places for public events and family picnics. But what better place? Here we can study and enjoy a local history archive and a nature reserve right in the city a place that has long captured the imaginations of poets. These flowers are I. I poor Fanny Heard, Sir or Madam, a little girl here, sepulchred. Once I flit fluttered like a bird above the grass, as now I wave in daisy shapes above my grave. I am one bachelor bowering, gent, Sir or Madam, 
In shingled oak my bones were pent, hence more than a hundred years I spent in my feet of change from a coughing thrall to a dancer in green as leaves on a wall. Thank you.